Um, so, uh, following on from Lara's uh, excellent talk, we, uh, we're now having a panel, and uh, that's about um, communication and communicating risk. And we're going to kick off uh, with Robin Gorner. Robin is uh, Vice Chair of the Technical Review Panel for Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria. Um, she's had a life devoted to exploring the impact of AIDS uh, and similar um, challenges, uh, and uh, especially those impacts upon women. And uh, she's going to talk now about lessons from AIDS and COVID, for communicating risk and uncertainty. Robin. Well, thank you all, and thank you for this extraordinary opportunity to be with you. As I've said to many of you personally, it's um, a remarkable honor and a little bit terrifying. So I'm very grateful to SJ and Lalitha for tracking me down and placing me in an environment where I am learning uh, far more than I can ever offer. Um, so just to ground this, I was expecting tomorrow to be flying to South Africa, which is where I'm fortunate enough to spend part of my time uh, having worked there for the British government. And this is a group of people from the Treatment Action Council Campaign. Some of you may know that in South Africa we have the largest epidemic of HIV in the world, an epidemic that was allowed to get out of control by malign government policies that denied the link between HIV and AIDS. And this is a remarkable uh, social movement, one of the, I think, the most important social movements in the world called the Treatment Action Campaign. And I love this because these are all, or the majority will be people living with HIV who are also tackling uh, the COVID pandemic. And I I think also doing it with incredible creativity and joy, um, which is something to pick up, I think, from Lara's uh, communication. Um, the remarks I'm going to make are based on a book that I'm working on about living my life between the two pandemics of AIDS and COVID, which have affected me in very different ways. Um, and I have to give a disclaimer that, as any of you who are working on books know, uh, trying to condense into 25 minutes all these brilliant thoughts that you want to test with people or not so brilliant thoughts is extremely challenging. And if I speak too fast, I'm relying on someone to wave at me and slow me down because I do have that tendency. And the other caveat to say at the outset is I'm going to assume people know what happened in the UK around COVID. Um, so uh, my apologies in advance if, for that uh, cultural assumption. And this, I think, is my starting point, um, which is something uh, that I said in, uh, in an article I wrote for The Independent marking the 40th anniversary of AIDS, which is that new epidemics demand humility, curiosity and hope. And I think humility, curiosity and hope are buzzwords that I've heard through these past couple of days. Um, at the same time as saying that, many of my friends have described me as the Cassandra of COVID, uh, and I have felt that way uh, for the past couple of years. Um, and uh, I was really pleased that SJ talked so much about uh, profits earlier because I, I have a secret degree in theology from the other place, and uh, I remember studying prophecy and being quite taken by it. Um, and the reason I wrote about this uh, at the time of the 40th anniversary was it struck me very strongly that on the 5th of June 1981, and I'm sorry for the not so great slides, um, technology is not my thing, um, we heard about these five gay men in California who had pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. It was shocking, and epidemiologists did what they do, which is try and track what was going on. And on the 5th of January... 2020, WHO um, uh, published its report of those first four people in Wuhan, China, with a pneumonia of unknown cause. Now, across the two pandemics, and this is a little photo I took in London during lockdown one, um, I think there are a couple of things we need to do is learn from history, look across our borders and tell the truth. Um, and as I was reflecting on this, I have the good fortune of having inherited uh, a library of books from a, an NGO called Avert, which is an AIDS organization. And as I was sitting writing every morning and looking at all these books on my shelf, I kept seeing titles and I thought, is that about AIDS or COVID? Um, so when people say to me that this pandemic, I wonder what they're talking about, because from my perspective, there have been two pandemics. Um, and these are some of the things, some of the areas where I think we need to learn across the pandemics as we communicate and as we understand what's going on currently and what is likely to come again. And these are the domains where I think we need to drill down. 
It's the virus stupid. We'll remember it's the economy stupid. One of the things that I want to uh, talk about in respect of COVID and this current pandemic and what we have learned from previous pandemics is how quickly we responded. And I think there's an important lesson there. AIDS was never declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization. There's a very particular reason for that, which is that the international health regulations, which allow WHO to announce pandemics, were only actually passed into law in 2007. And as you saw, we first identified AIDS in uh, 1981. The world stepped up remarkably quickly. It was, in fact, on the 30th of January 2020 that WHO invoked the public health emergency of international concern, um, which was to state that SARS-CoV-2, this new virus, was a, something that risked, um, uh, required an, an, an international response. Um, what's also really significant is that this clip from the National Institute of Health by January 2020, we had had the first sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which led to the ability to put in place diagnostics, diagnostics that are no longer free in this country, but that have had a game-changing impact on the pandemic globally, even if it's not controlled them as much as anyone hoped. By contrast, these two books here are by uh, Luc Montagnier, who with his colleague Françoise barré sinoussi in Paris was the co-discoverer of what we now call HIV. And he was locked into a very unpleasant battle with Robert Gallo from the US, who discovered uh, the same virus uh, a couple of years later. So between 1981, when we heard about those five gay men in America, and 1986, five years, research teams on the two continents were squabbling over who found the virus first, over what to call it, and consequently, because there were huge royalties at play, there was no effective test for HIV over those five years. In fact, it took us nearly a decade to get a test for HIV. And I think it's important as we look back and think about what's gone well and what's gone horribly with COVID to remember that scientists, including Professor Gilbert of the other place, um, have stood on the shoulders of giants and have stood on the failures. So Shots in the Dark is a great book by science writer John Cohen exploring how we have never got an AIDS vaccine. And over my 40 years working on HIV, HIV and AIDS, we've always said in five years' time we'll have a vaccine. Well, we don't, and we probably won't because it's a retrovirus, which is an awful lot more complex. But the point I want to make here is, is twofold. One, we learn from history and we do better because of what went wrong in the past, but also that some of the same problems remain. And in respect to vaccines, I would say there are two critical problems. One is vaccine equity, and I think we'll come on to that, and people have spoken about that a little bit. But the other is we risk missing the humanity, and we miss risk, uh, seeing how fundamental social science is to our response to any pandemic. Vaccine, phenomenal. COVID, I hate to tell you, it's not over, and it's not over just because most of us have had a jab. What I think is fundamental to the response to AIDS and the reason that AIDS is not known as a pandemic uh, generally is not just because of the international health regulations, but also because we have had a pretty effective response. And one of the reasons we've had an effective response is because communities have responded. And I think Lalitha and others have got things to say about how uh, we, we define HIV, but this, these are images from Paris, from America, and from South Africa about social movements that I believe to have been some of the most effective in the world. And in some ways, I think the next two photos I have really are about Lara's red triangle. They're about how people respond. Um, they are about the people and about the politics. There's a small woman on the corner there. Her hair wasn't gray at the time, but she was protesting with a bunch of people with AIDS outside the American embassy uh, back in the mid-1980s. And in this country, and it's important that I say this because I'm going to be a little bit less pleasant about politicians shortly, in fact, the Tory government were remarkably good on AIDS back in the day in the 80s. And in part, that was because there was always a cross-party response. And Norman Fowler, the then health minister, was remarkably strong in the response. 
In terms of long COVID, which is something that annoyingly I live with, we've had uh, a similar attempt to mount this kind of response. And I told a few stories of what was going on for me back in early 2020 when I didn't recover from my acute infection. We told those stories to the all-party parliamentary group that has tried to make COVID a cross-party response. And this uh, bottom photograph makes me laugh a little bit, which isn't very kind, um, because there are now nearly two million of us living with long COVID and trying to mobilise a bunch of people, one of whose uh, uh, fundamental symptoms is profound exhaustion, is extremely difficult. So we haven't mounted the sort of uh, lively community response that you saw in the HIV crisis, um, but it doesn't mean it doesn't matter, and I will come back to that. Um, but I think, again, people and politics. The other key learning is, of course, the numbers. And we've talked a lot about the numbers. And I really, really appreciated that uh, presentation on maps, which changed my thinking profoundly. Um, I don't want to dwell on this too long. But I just think one of the things that has been is so important as we look at these numbers and we look globally. And I know that you as a community do that, but look at where those red blobs are in the center of the graph underneath in terms of COVID. They concentrate in Europe and those are showing the population density um, of COVID. And I think we often fail to notice how out of control our COVID epidemics are in this part of the world. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who decided to get a copy of the plague year during the pandemic. It was very hard to get a copy. Um, and, and I had to stop reading it at a certain point because the litany of numbers and numbers growing and people understanding, it tells so much of the story of what we're living through. But I also leaned on, on a, um, a, a book by a friend of mine uh, who published back in the 80s, uh, early 90s, about a book called Safety in Numbers, where he argued that in terms of the HIV crisis, we were giving a message about this being an equal opportunities virus that was false. And I believe we did the same in early COVID. And among the many missteps was not trying hard enough to focus on where the risks really were. Um, in HIV, back in the 80s, a few people uh, published on the inherent racism, which we never dealt with adequately in the response to HIV. And part of why it's a forgotten pandemic is that we uh, did not take seriously the, the way in which the epidemic was moving and the catastrophic impact it had on Africa. And yet when I started in HIV in mid-1980s, we thought it was going to affect Asia far more than Africa. We didn't think Africa would see much of an epidemic. So the inability to really think carefully and track the data and see where it's going matters. And I'm sure many of you will remember what happened in the, er in the early stage of 2020 in the UK. This is just a, a clip from an article that I wrote, um, I think it was April 2020, where we looked at the first 100 health workers and you can see from the images the unequal impact, which was to do with social factors um, and the, the total lack of respect for, for the workers in our community. So focusing where epidemics go is fundamentally important. It's not just that it's epidemio epidemiologically smart, but it's also the right thing to do. And underpinning effective responses to HIV and also to COVID, I would say, is a, is a respect for human rights. Um, it's something I could talk about forever, but I'm not going to, because instead I want to just say something about government communication of the two pandemics. To my knowledge, this is the only time that the government has written out to everyone's home in the UK. First about AIDS in 1987, I received this leaflet, and some of you will have done, many of you will have been too young to receive it. Now, what's really interesting here is remember, we'd only called it HIV for one year. So we were in the same state of uncertainty, and I think this point about communicating uncertainty is really, really critical. We were under a government that was a conservative government. We have uh, really great uh, stories from Lord Fowler about how he had to sit down and explain various things to Margaret Thatcher, like oral sex, to which she said, do people do that? Um, and on the basis of those conversations, it was agreed that this pamphlet be sent to every single home in the UK. And I recall at the time people laughing about the fact that little old ladies in Surrey would be being sent things about needles and they would assume that it was about knitting needles, not injecting drug needles. But we gave the information that we had. And it wasn't perfect and it's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty close. And we helped people to join in the conversation. This is what we know and this is what we don't know. Then we got this two years ago. People remember getting that? I'm sure most of you received it. What did this tell you? 
You must stay at home. We are giving you one simple instruction. You must stay at home. And I found this absolutely perplexing when a few months ago we were told to take personal responsibility. How do you take personal responsibility when what you've been told is to obey the law? You've not been told anything about why you might obey the law, what the dynamics of risk are. We didn't know at the time we received this whether to wear masks or not. I'm afraid I was already an early adopter of the mask. It didn't stop me from getting COVID. But then again, I didn't know it was an FP95 I needed. Um, but we did know things about the likely dynamics of transmission. There were amazing scientists who were already saying, I think this is going to be aerosol driven like TB. But none of that was being communicated. In fact, what's also really interesting is if any of you remember Neil Ferguson, does that name ring a bell? Imperial College, March 2020, his modelling. His modelling said, expected a compliance rate of between 50 and 70% of the population. So the early lockdown was framed around that. And we then got a surprise, didn't we? Because when you pay people to stay at home in the kind of rather grim and dreary part of the year, guess what? They did it. The compliance rates were way in excess. But what, in my opinion, was going on was responding to a legal instruction rather than understanding a personal risk. And I, I really look forward to this communications workshop later. Because what I believe, and many of you have spoken about in, in, in various ways, is that the arts is fundamental. Um, and I've really struggled to find any artistic response to COVID. I would suggest that actually it's the memes and the gifts that uh, have been the greatest gift in terms of creativity around COVID. But thus far, there have not been any other great artistic expressions, whereas I could have given you another half an hour on some of the artistic responses uh, to, to HIV. And indeed, it was seeing the play The Normal Heart that changed my life from being a theology student enjoying theatre at Oxford to getting involved in the AIDS crisis and not managing to get out of that. There are a huge number of creative responses, whether it's the rock musical Rent or the movies Philadelphia. And why does this matter? Well, I mean, we saw it with the poppies. Um, we've also had, in terms of HIV, the quilt, which demonstrates just the extraordinary loss of, HIV, of people to HIV. But it touches our emotions, and it's our emotions that make us respond, not the law and the facts, in, in a sustained way. Um, and I think the conversation about charismatic people equally really important in terms of getting people who connect with us as humans. And I was very struck by Pablo's uh, word cloud saying that we think about people when we're here thinking about existential risk. So my next set of thoughts is to really think about um, looking across the borders. And I, I'm not going to dwell on it, but you know, I think we know that in this country, one of the reasons that our response to COVID has been so weak is also that we put our trade concerns and our challenges around Brexit first. And, and some have said that the greatest export we've made over this period of time was the Delta variant. And indeed, there are some uh, indications we did the same with Omicron. Delta has spread or did spread at such remarkable speed because we did not do the right thing from a public health perspective. We prioritised trade at that time. But there are far more reasons uh, to, to think about looking across the borders and to think globally. And this is my wonderful friend, uh, uh, Goodwill Ambassador James Chow, who's a TV host in China, who's been attacked hugely for his work on COVID. And yet he has been, I think, one of the most significant Cassandras. And he was uh, broadcasting from China back at the beginning of 2020, letting people know what was going on, exhausting himself in the middle of the night. And here he was in May 2020. Now, May 2020 was the eve of the World Health Assembly when the World Health Organization uh, was convening its governing body, the health ministers of the world. And they were doing that um, it, it, when there were 90,000 COVID cases a day. There had been 6 million already. So this had moved at remarkable speed. And as you can read on the slide, I hope, um, James was already saying, you know, we are mourning for the world. And this is, is two years ago, right? Um, and pleading that we put away our national interests and that we work collectively as a world. It seems pretty obvious. Any pandemic does not respect borders. And yet the backdrop of this is this same point about, in, about global health diplomacy, which is also very much where I think I've located my life. And 
I was talking to some of you about nuclear weapons, and you were saying, where's the treaty? Where's the binding treaty? What happened as a result of this pandemic? Well, in 2007, we had the international health regulations, which were what was used to declare COVID as a pandemic. What happens is that, is that a binding treaty? Well, the response, the global response, was that President Trump withdrew his funds from WHO, the largest donor to WHO, excluding the Gates Foundation, um, we pulled the money out at the very moment, one month before James spoke, that the world needed to respond collectively. And in fact, the public health emergency of international concern requires countries, we have a legal duty to step up, and yet we did not. Globally, we did not. We did not find a way. Instead, what happened was a fracturing and a China-US conflict emerging in, in, the, in the walls of Avenue Appia. Um, now, a pandemic uh, preparedness treaty is in the making, um, but the current timetable is that the earliest that it will be delivered is 2024, and those of you who live in and around the global community will not be surprised to hear that there are squabbles between the obvious partners as to what it will include. But there is an attempt to, to do that. I'm going to skip across these slides, but I did just want to say that as we look globally and we think globally, I, I just want to underscore this, think about our local and try and remember that it's not normal. As we live through the let it rip five million a day, it's not normal. These are the two graphs that I follow daily. I live in Wealdon most of the time, which has a population of 160,000 people, 10,000 of whom two days ago had COVID. My sons, lucky souls, currently live on the island of Bali, which has a population of 4.3 million. And in the past seven days, in the area that they live in, they had about 50 cases. And this has been their outbreak, their Omicron outbreak. So let's hold on to the fact that actually other countries are getting this right and why we're we not learning from each other. This is a graph that shows the vaccine equity. You can see the shameful lack of vaccination uh, in, in, in Africa. It's just blazingly obvious. The green countries have got great vaccination. The red have got hardly any. So there's a number of campaigners, many of them standing on the shoulders of people who campaigned in HIV to remove the, uh, the trade laws that create this challenge. Um, and I think one of the reasons that HIV has had such a response is that the Americans in the top uh, corner trained people like me to be treatment activists, and then when they'd finished with the Europeans, they uh, got involved with supporting African colleagues, and globally we built uh, a response that demanded treatments get into bodies, and in fact, that happened far more quickly than one would have imagined in the gallo Montagne squabbles of the early 80s. In the 90s, we got there. I'm going to move beyond that. But learning from each other, this is uh, something I think is really important, and I want to go back to the point about social science. Um, we talk often about the global response as being an, in a very top-down way when we think about pandemics. And, and this uh, I found on a, an Australian uh, university website from February 2018 about mask wearing. Why have we got such great or much more effective responses in many Asian countries? Well, it's because many Asian responses know about respiratory hygiene. And you, we will have heard that back in the uh, early 2020s, particularly people like Jeremy Hunt, um, the, the chair of the Health and Social Care Committee, who has an understanding of what happens in Asia, saying, hang on, why are we not looking? Why are we not looking at what's happening in countries that understand respiratory? The time respiratory hygiene I heard first from Dame Professor Ann Johnson, who back in the 1990s was responsible for the National Survey on Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyle, someone who understands behavioral science and social science. We have other public health measures, in addition to mask wearing, that have been very, very poorly deployed. And, um, Another one, you know, again, from my, my love and, uh, of, of Indonesia. And finally, after two years, I was able well enough to travel to go and see my son, who'd been happily stuck on the island of Bali for two years, uh, whilst I'd been slugging it out in central London. And I sat in quarantine for a week. And you know what? I didn't mind at all. But I was following Facebook groups where people were outraged and furious. And I remember reading one comment from a, a Balinese um, man who said, if, if you're not willing to do the quarantine required by the Indonesian government to protect the people of Indonesia, perhaps you shouldn't be coming here. So quarantine is a well-respected and used approach to public health. 
but it needs to be equitable and thought through. And what you see in this corner is what happened in response to Omicron, which biological epidemiologists tell us may well have originated in this country rather than in South Africa, let me say as an aside. The day when the travel restrictions and the banning happened around Omicron, before people understood its, uh, it, its virulence, you can see the countries that were banned from entering the US. They were the countries that didn't have so many cases of Omicron. Look at the red countries. Those are the ones that had Omicron, and only two of them were banned from entering the US, South Africa and Botswana. But the US also banned Eswatini, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Angola, Zambia. Why? They didn't even have any Omicron. I think we know the answer. Now, I need to say um, there's a bit of a trigger warning. This is a distressing image coming up next. Um, uh, but, you know, going on from travel restrictions is one response. There are other responses uh, to in public health world. And this is, let's for, not forget, there have been other dreadful infectious disease epidemics which continue to recur. And the reason I'm showing this upsetting image is, A, because actually I think infectious diseases which kill are very upsetting. Um, one of the first moments that I started to think about the connections between AIDS and COVID was when I heard about people with COVID being put in body bags, and that reminded me of what happened in AIDS back in the mid-80s. But this is an image um, from Sierra Leone, and the reason for me it's important is that this was the incredibly distressing way in which someone who had died was treated. And the AIDS community got involved, and they got involved with the faith communities, and they found compassionate ways of dealing with burial and funerals. And so we need to start that interrelationship. And now to something slightly more joyful, the Easter Bunny. Does anyone remember this? So, I mean, we talked about how we communicate and how we communicate and politics in terms, and I really appreciated Laura's sort of commentary on this, but I thought this... The, the difference between these two styles of communication was so fundamentally important. And I don't know whether any of you had the pleasure of watching Jacinda Ahern communicate. And if not, I recommend it as a, a happy way of, of spending your time. But Easter 2020, she came on to the official channels and she told people that the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy are essential workers. They may work through lockdown. And by the way, if they don't get there, put an image in your window to help the other kids who uh, want to get their uh, Easter bunny uh, because, you know, it might be a bit busy. What did we do? Stay home. Don't put your friends and family at danger. Nothing about who might be at differential risk. Okay, my final very brief news uh, or thoughts are to move on from this fundamental point about humanity at the heart. I, and, you know, when I was thinking about this, I said, tell the truth. There is so much to say about this. Um, and how ironic it was to hear you mention happy birthday at the time we're thinking about birthday parties in number 10. And this was my favourite bit, and I thought we might need a little bit of levity by this point. I Do you remember the wonderful uh, presentation from Boris Johnson, which uh, Matt Lucas from Little Britain ripped off as, so we're saying, don't go to work, go to work. Don't take public transport, go to work. Don't go to work. Stay indoors. If you can work from home, go to work. Don't go to work. Go outside. Don't go outside. And uh, then we will all go into something or other. Um, and my point on this is simply we are living in a time of uncertainty and we have to find a way to deal with that. And I've run out of time to tell you what that means for long COVID, but simply to say that in um, March 2021, we got this uh, long-term plan from the Blair Institute, uh, which reminded us that those of us who didn't get well, well, who got sick in lockdown one, were just told to stay at home and treat it like the flu, as people are being told now, which is perhaps safer with uh, vaccination, but not entirely safe. But unfortunately, many of us didn't get better. And then people like me thought we were better 11 months on, and have recently had relapses and discovered that this virus appears to continue to do damage. And in fact, there's emerging medical data showing us that long COVID is very real. And there are now nearly 2 million of us with long COVID. There are now uh, over 200,000 uh, NHS workers infected at work who are 
challenged and unable to work full time and who are being fired from their jobs. The long term catastrophic impacts of the long COVID epidemic, I believe, are something we need to investigate. And I will very happily answer questions on that because I've run out of time to tell you more. But here is my lovely friend, Talia, who thought she was better too, but got a dose of Omicron. And she made, had a happy 28th birthday, but she's back in bed now. And like me, monitoring her pulse rate daily because it keeps going really, really wonky. So uh, we need to think about how we talk about what we don't know. Um, and I think you are the people who know how to do that. Thank you. used to be at Caesar, working very closely with uh, Martin Rees on uh, issues around responsible innovation. He's now Professor of East Asian Law at the University of Hagen. He's Professor of East Asian Law at the University of Hagen. Julius. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, let me start with my sincerest gratitude to Caesar for the time I could spend at Caesar and for inviting me back, and also to the organizers uh, of this conference. I had the honor of organizing, co-organizing the very first uh, conference on catastrophic risk back in 2016 together with Catherine Rhodes and others, so I know what kind of work is entailed uh, in this. So my uh, topic today is the Fukushima accident, not in terms of a nuclear accident, but it, in terms of its potential for us to learn from it to prevent uh, future catastrophes of existential and global scale. Especially uh, managing extreme technological risk, which was our project at CESAR initially. The questions I'm going to address is why is Fukushima such an interesting study case to uh, think about a reduction of existential risks. How can we do this? And what exactly are the most important lessons now 11 years after the disaster? Significant time has passed. It's also very far away. There are much, much more immediate catastrophes unfolding as we speak, uh, a war, uh, the climate emergency, uh, and the pandemic. And um, let me assure you that, that these immediate threats are also in my mind, because um, I've been fortunate enough to host a Ukrainian refugee family for three weeks now. They're in my apartment now that I'm in the UK. So uh, these threats are very immediate and present, but still I think it's worth to think back about Fukushima. My angle is an institutional angle. I'm a lawyer by training and a Japanologist. Uh, I think about risk governance and technology policy. What we're not talking about today, but which is also important, is of course the future of nuclear energy, the potentials and risks involved, but that's not going to be my topic today. So why is Fukushima so interesting? Uh, SJ has told us today, uh, uh, this morning, uh, about the importance of real catastrophes as study systems. Um, and Fukushima, as it happens, was the costliest uh, disaster before the COVID-19 epidemic globally, at least the costliest single disaster. It is interesting in that it uh, represents a combination of natural and technological and social factors that have contributed to it. To it. it is a so-called NATEC disaster. It was a triple catastrophe of an earthquake, a tsunami, and subsequent nuclear meltdowns, or in other words, a double whammy of nature and technology. And therefore, due to its complexity, uh, I think it's especially uh, interesting when we think about future compound disasters and concurring crises. It's also interesting because it, it involves a dual use technology, nuclear fission, that like other technologies has strategic importance to our um, uh, national economies, but uh, also um, poses certain risks. It's interesting because Japan was a high-tech economy, an advanced uh, economy with uh, sophisticated levels of governance that would have otherwise not thought it to be uh, the setting of such a disaster. Um, 
Another interesting aspect is the high level of political contestation. If we think about, say, the Challenger disaster, there was much less political and social implications around it. But um, what is likely is that future existential risks do entail a certain level of political uh, debate, uh, I would assume. Furthermore, it's interesting that the Fukushima disaster has been well studied technologically, techn technologically um, and also socially, uh, which makes it distinct from, say, more historical um, cases of collapse that are more in distant history and we don't really have the data on. And finally, uh, Japan is also relevant in that it's uh, strongly underrepresented in the existential risk community, in the existential risk scholarship, possibly due to reasons of language, while at the same time it offers, of course, a high level of technological innovation, scientific advances, and particularly disaster uh, scholarship is highly advanced, uh, highly experienced in Japan, and we're not drawing on these voices, on these scholars adequately in the ex-risk community, I would argue. So these are some of the reasons why I think the case is of particular importance and interest. But how, how exactly can we learn from such a localized event in Japan for potential global catastrophes? The challenge, of course, is to prepare for the unprecedented. We've talked about this yesterday, and we already heard about three different approaches, including imagination, foresight and forecasting, and even wargaming. And scaling up lessons from smaller disaster is another way of thinking about potential existential risks. So the idea for me and my colleagues as legal scholars is to shift the focus away from the hazard, and the existential risk community has been at least in the past very much focused on interesting existential hazards, and shift the focus to vulnerability, particularly the prevention failures and the mitigation failures uh, involved in this accident, which appear to be, I think, cross-cutting. So the governance failures that we, that we could see in this case and in other cases, I think, are prevalent. Whether you think about climate change, nuclear weapons, there seem to be recurring failures in the governance that seem to be the bottlenecks of X-risk uh, reduction, to me, much more than a lack of scientific understanding. So how do we transfer these lessons? It involves a process of, first of all, translating Japanese scholarship, transferring knowledge, uh, transposing ideas into other sectors, and transplanting solutions. It's about scaling the lessons from smaller disasters to potentially existential ones, to a wider range of sectors and a higher magnitude of risk. So, it's, the idea is not to think about a supersized Fukushima scenario. Um, rather, it's about identifying patterns of social, corporate, and government vulnerabilities that uh, could be relevant in future catastrophes. So this kind of social turn has been a movement in the conventional uh, disaster uh, sciences um, a long time ago, but I think it's still uh, to fully happen in the X-risk community. So Fukushima is an interesting case of us being aware of certain risks, having possible solutions, prevention and mitigation measures at our disposal, but still failing to implement them in an effective way. So knowledge and even availability of solutions does, of course, not necessarily lead to prevention. Let me talk about two groups of law and policy lessons that we have as a collective team of around 20 authors who have collaborated with me uh, in a volume uh, on Fukushima and the law, which is long awaited but very soon forthcoming, which is uh, now at almost 800 pages, but you have the opportunity to get the gist of it in, in these 10 minutes from me. Let me try to summarize in a simplified way. First of all, the disaster exposed the high degree of regulatory, administrative, scientific, and even media capture by a single industry. Capture here refers to a specific private interest dominating or and undermining broader public legislative interests. So the expertise, the monopolistic structure, 
the profit um, and the uh, strategic importance of this industry helped um, you know, to create this process in the case of Fukushima, but we can easily think about other sectors today where we have similar tendencies. Secondly and related is um, a problem of the ownership of high-risk industries. Of course, neither private nor public ownership of these uh, entities engaged in inherently dangerous activities are perfect solutions, but the limitations of ordinary uh, um, corporate law in these areas have been, I think, uh, very easy to see. And they require, if not only reforms of corporate governance, um, perhaps even novel forms of stewardship of such enterprises. Another related aspect is, that, is the corporate veil that helps to externalize risks away from shareholders, in addition to uh, special exemptions granted by nuclear law, which have effectively shielded the entire corporation, in our case, Tokyo Denryoku TEPCO, the operator of the nuclear power plant, from back-end and fat tail risks and costs. I've expanded on this in an article for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. The financial incentives reward a certain degree of underinvestment, at least beyond the regulatory required level, of, uh, in costly safety uh, measures. And the legal exceptionalisms prevalent in nuclear law, but not only in nuclear law, prevent a certain deterrence of those crucially responsible for the safety of these technologies. This is, of course, even more concerning, given the inadequacy of conventional tort and criminal liability systems, which operate ex post facto to prevent disasters in the first place. So in the absence of adequate legislation, it is reasonable for a corporation not to prevent losses exceeding a certain threshold, as it would be bankrupted either way which calls for reforms of corporate governance and specific rules for investors in companies engaged in inherently dangerous activities. Another uh, factor is the limitation of the legal concept of standing, which prevents third parties from intervening before an accident has happened. Overall, the risk governance lessons from the case of Fukushima are focused on moral hazards in so-called take-the-money-and-run companies with unsolved back-end and fat-tailed costs. And that, of course, is not limited to the nuclear uh, industry. The second aspect of risk governance lessons relates around the nexus between government and public interests. First of all, and we've heard about this, uh, I think, uh, sufficiently already, is the lack of trust in, government in, uh, in the government in the response phase. If you remember, the time after Fush Fukushima, there was a lot of uncertainty, perhaps similar to the, the case of the COVID-19 pandemic, and, uh, involved uh, in, in the health risks uh, of this accident. Similarly, there was certainly an inadequate level of risk communication in the immediate wake of the accident. There was also, and again, I think this resonates with our memory of the COVID-19 pandemic, a lack of effective coordination, not only nationally, if we think about the various government uh, agencies uh, involved in Japan, so it was about disaster reconstruction, it was about regulating the nuclear industry, and so forth, but also a lack of effective coordination internationally, at least in the immediate aftermath of the disaster. The disaster also demonstrated the failure of the IAEA's review system, which before the fact had been praised as a very effective uh, way of dealing with nuclear safety internationally. And uh, finally, there are even vertical and horizontal uh, issues of collaboration within the government uh, in Japan and between certain sectors that are siloed from each other through different areas of law. For instance, nuclear safety and radiation protection are two entirely different concepts in law, and any uh, installation, nuclear installation uh, operated by the military, again, is uh, again exempt from nuclear law. So even within nuclear law, we have these regulatory silos that prevent a holistic approach. It's even more trivial to say that a potential existential catastrophe would ultimately affect all sectors of society, uh, 
So if we fail to deal with a limited disaster um, nationally, administratively, we would certainly fail to do so with a global existential disaster. Now, let me conclude by a few more uh, observations about the lessons learned. There are a lot of lessons observed from Fukushima. These are well documented in international technical reports by the EIAEA, the Japanese government, and others. What's striking, though, is that very few of these lessons have been adopted, implemented on an international scale. For example, there is not a single IAEA internationally binding legal agreement that has come about after Fukushima. This is very different to, for instance, the Chernobyl accident, which was followed by two or three important international agreements. There are no such agreements in the wake of Fukushima, although it perfectly demonstrated the inadequacy of the previously praised IEA safety review system. Secondly, Another interesting example is that the European Union revised its civil protection framework very soon after Fukushima. However, there was no reference made to the Fukushima accident and the lessons entirely included. A third and perhaps most striking example is the United Nations Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the so-called Sendai Framework enacted in Japan in 2015, four years after the disaster. If you look at this framework, it's again striking that it is limited mostly to natural disasters and so-called NATEC disasters at the interface of, of technology and society are excluded from the remit. This has a number of reasons which have to do with competence, but it also has to do with the fact that the Sendai framework was neg negotiated in Japan and because Sendai is very close to Fukushima, um, there was also an element of not upsetting the Japanese and therefore all this was kind of excluded. In a similar way, the Fukushima accident has been disowned as a disaster made in Japan, blamed on certain cultural and societal factors that wouldn't be prevalent otherwise. I question this and we question this because the um, uh, elements of Japanese society, including a high degree of, uh, say, respect for authority, groupthink, high pressure from above, these are not social phenomena exclusive to Japan. I would argue they are prevalent in many corporations and other contexts, contexts outside of Japan. Now, these are somewhat sobering. Uh, results, I would say, but I hope that they have conveyed the reason why I think the Fukushima accident uh, uh, remains uh, an important study system, and hopefully um, you will see the results in, in our forthcoming book very soon. Thank you very much. Julius, thank you, and uh, my apologies to those online who couldn't hear me before, but as I'm just filling in between speakers, you don't really need to listen to me. Um, so uh, next we have um, Lalitha Sandaran, who is a research associate uh, here at CESA, a very, very valued and appreciated one, and uh, she's going to be talking about her work on bio-risk and particularly around regulation. Lalitha. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so as Paul said, my primary focus within BioRisk at CSER has been and continues to be regulation, governance, biosafety, biosecurity, and primarily looking at that in synthetic biology. So what I'm going to address here with you today and in this panel is in one sense a departure from that. But in another sense, it's a return to my previous life. I think the biggest cliche amongst existential risk scholars is that most of us ended up here through quite circuitous, unconventional routes. There is no conventional route to end up here. My own started when I began working on a synthetic biology biosensor. The aim of the project was to de detect deadly arsenic in drinking water in wells in Bangladesh and Nepal. So we engineered a bacterium to change color in response to arsenic concentrations and do that for us. So one way to trace that story to where I am now is to think about the risks of deploying uncertain technologies in the field, how to regulate genetically modified organisms, how to do responsible research, and that is what the bulk of my research focuses on now. The other route is one that I'm much less adept at navigating and let alone talking about. 
And that's actually the one I'm going to be talking about today. It isn't as well developed in the context of extras. And I hope this is a forum to unpick those ideas and figure out as a community what we think is valuable to think about and to contribute to. So I was working on a SynBio tool to help address the challenge of what is essentially a chronic health issue. Arsenicosis causing a large range of cancers, long-term degradation of health with intergenerational effects. The WHO in the year 2000 called it the biggest poisoning of a population in history. Is this not catastrophic? Perhaps if we're being quite cold-hearted about it, we can say, well, it's not existential. It sucks to be Bangladeshi, but it's not even globally catastrophic. Why should we care? For me, that misses the point completely. And I think the point of these three days is to invite us from this community to question our assumptions, to question the boundaries we draw or the, that we feel we need to draw, and most importantly, to consider deeply where we can gain insights and learn lessons. I don't think we need to circumscribe where we learn our lessons from based on how many people die. In fact, we'd better not, or we'd have learned those lessons far too late. So I entered the world of Global Catastrophic Biological Risk, GCBRs, with in the back of my mind an inkling that important lessons could and should be learned from local catastrophes like arsenic. Slow moving ones, perhaps. And these didn't have to look like pandemics from the movies. But typically, definitions of GCBRs go along the short, sharp shock model, where the risks involve rapidly spreading high mortality events. That's kind of a folk understanding, so let's dig a little bit deeper. And there's an entire special issue of the journal Health Security that I would encourage you to look at that focuses on GCBRs, and that includes a working definition. I'm going to read that out. Those events in which biological agents, whether naturally emerging or re-emerging, deliberately created or released, or laboratory engineered and escaped, could lead to sudden, extraordinary, widespread disaster beyond the capability of national and international governments and the private sector to control. If unchecked, GCBRs would lead to great suffering, loss of life, and sustained damage to national governments, international relationships, economies, social stability, or global security. You'll notice that fatalities are just one element here. Mostly, this is about widespread disaster. And I think Robin has argued quite persuasively, there has been widespread disaster already. We continue to see widespread disaster. That same special issue asks the question, has HIV and AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa been a global catastrophic biological risk. And one way to think about that is in some of the earlier def earliest definitions of, GC of catastrophic risk and even existential risk of a marked inflection point in the, tra in the tra trajectory of a community. That same special issue also argues that human fatality is just one measure of harm. It's not the only measure, nor is it likely the best. A biological agent that debilitates its host especially when the effects manifest over a long period of time, might cause greater devastating harm. If the effects prevent productivity and demand expensive and limited resources, there will be psychological, social, and economic impacts that would scale and sustain more extensively than deaths alone. So essentially, catastrophic societal damage is possible by biological agents that do not cause mass casualties necessarily. And for me, this meant biological events that were chronic. And that piqued my interest. So this was the starting point of a project that we embarked on at CSER about three years ago with Lauren Holt and Catherine Rhodes. Before the short, sharp shock of COVID, I know it doesn't feel very short, and certainly before our dawning and belated realization of long COVID, which I hope Robin will be able to go into in much more detail during the Q&A. What I'll go through now in an abbreviated form is our exploration of that subject. What we were interested was in was chronic illness, where the risks are obviously not of immediate mortality, but long-term morbidity. And we saw this as an understudied facet of GCBRs. We had some intuitions, but intuitions aren't analysis. In order to study these risks, we compared case studies to explore the immediate and long-term effects associated with them at varying levels of intensity. So the case studies we looked at were natural outbreaks, but additional risks could come from deliberate engineering of chronic disease pathogens and their use as bioweapons. Policies to address the risks associated with engineered pathogens also generally focus on perceived lethality, and they pay very little attention to the possibility of engineered pathogens leading to chronic conditions. Although these may well be more insidious, they may be more difficult to detect and to treat. 
And of course, this is against a backdrop where everything is getting easier to engineer. Pathogens, and, or pathogens whether they are chronic or acute. Toxoplasma, my favorite organism because it's what I studied for my PhD, is one of the most genetically tractable parasites. It also results in a lifelong infection. By most estimate, about half the people in this room are infected with a chronic, chronic infection of toxo. It might be a bit lower because a lot of exorcists don't eat meat. It might be a little higher. A lot of exorcists have cats, but roughly half. And when you're chronically infected, toxo lives in your muscles, it lives in your brain, and has a constant, complex, and largely cryptic interaction of signaling. Despite this, despite, it, despite its tractability, despite its potential engineerability, it's on nobody's biosecurity radar, because it doesn't kill all that many people, except for in the case of comorbidity with HIV and AIDS. It's chronic. So leaving aside that nightmarish and potentially slightly information hazardy scenario, um, it's still true that even for natural chron chronic threats, the impacts accrete over time. So traditional means of surveillance and response that can limit the spread are likely to be inadequate. So for us exploring this notion of chronic GCBRs, first was the question of definitions. In the past two years, I reckon most of us fancy ourselves epidemiologists now. At least we do when we're on Twitter. We all know what R is, we all know what R naught is. We know the difference between virulence, pathogenicity, or do we? I'm not sure that we really do. Actually, definitions are pretty tricky. You only have to look at the mess that was caused by the discrepancy between lay, medical, and epidemiological definitions of airborne to realize that definitions are crucial, or at the very least, a common understanding. So what is a common understanding of a chronic disease? Loads of institutions, governments, professionals, doctors work with these kinds of problems in human health that are understood to be chronic, but not always understood as the same thing. There's not agreement about what that means, nor is there agreement even about what attributes are the most important to look at. For instance, there is one broad assumption that chronic disease refers exclusively to non-communicable disorders, cancers from smoking, obesity, for example. But as we've just heard from the HIV and AIDS case, that needn't be, that needn't be so. They are by no means exclusive. Increasingly, many of the diseases traditionally classified as non-communicable are being found to have an infectious element to them. Many cancers, for example, I just saw a headline today about prostate cancer having potentially a bacterial element to it. Peptic ulcers are another example. And there's also a move to reclassify so-called, I hate this phrase, but lifestyle diseases like obesity and type 2 diabetes as socially transmitted. So definitions are crucial here. <clears throat> and in trying to build an understanding of the scope and characteristics of chronic disease threats that could be GCBRs, what we did was a bit of a dissection. We developed a framework for analysis that focuses on the characteristics of chronic disease that contribute to its overall severity and therefore to GCBR potential. As a starting point, and also to draw some bounds so that we could actually do some of this work, we started with those that are decidedly communicable, where the source of the disease is an infectious biological agent of some kind. We actually did a bit of a case study on AIDS, but that's been covered by someone far more expert than me, so I'll leave that out. The, one of the cases that I wanted to talk to you about is polio. Polio is caused by a single-stranded virus of the Picornaviridae family, in case that's of interest to anyone. It was thought to be an ancient disease. You can see uh, ancient art with, um, depicting people with withered limbs. But very little actual poliomyelitis was seen until the early, early 20th century. We had seasonal summer epidemics in developed countries. Polio is transmitted through the fecal oral route, and the R0 is estimated as between five and seven. That's scary enough, but what's even worse are its transmission characteristics. Individuals are infectious five to 20 days before symptoms appear. They're most infectious seven to, two, seven to 10 days post symptoms, but polio is communicable for three to six weeks, even without apparent symptoms afterwards. With those kinds of characteristics, quarantine was completely useless. Believe me, it was tried, but completely useless. The good news was that for the vast majority of people, these symptoms, if they ever came up in the first place, would resolve. The vast majority of these infections were asymptomatic, 90 to 95%, undetected. That's terrible news for the transmission dynamics, but very good news for the health outcomes of those individuals who were infected. Symptomatic infections could follow different routes, with roughly the following outcomes and proportions. Minor illness, 4 to 
Non-paralytic meningitis, about 1% to 2%, which could progress to paralysis, and the rest was paralysis. Could be spinal, could be bulbar, that's lower brainstem, with um, impeded breathing and swallowing, or both. Of these paralytic cases, and I realize it's a bit confusing, we're talking about percentages of percentages of percentages, but some percentage, 5 to, five to 10 percent of those would die, 10 percent would recover completely, and the remainder would have some permanent paralysis. And I want to make a note here about context. Those figures assume the provision of respiratory support. Without this, mortality goes up to 20, 25 to 75, and of course, respiratory support is not available, was not available then everywhere, it's not even available everywhere now. But if paralysis reached the chest, what was usually used was a tank respirator, what's called the iron lung that you might have seen in old movies and old pictures. That could be used to keep patients alive. The treatments range from a few weeks to the rest of, rest of the person's life. And cost estimates are a bit tricky to come by, but in general, the ballpark we're talking about here is that an iron lung would cost as much as a house. Now, polio, devastating as it was, would not, under most definitions, be called a GCBR. Why? It's because of the characteristics of the disease. Only a few percent of, of infected people went on to develop these forms of paralysis. And now, of course, we're on our way to eradication. Although, of course, there are setbacks in that as well. The second example I want to talk to you about is a bit more current. It's about Zika. Zika is another virus, and another one that usually manifests at first with easily resolved mild flu-like symptoms. One of the potential consequences of Zika infection, however, is that for a proportion of pregnant women who become infected with the virus for the first time, this infection will result in children born with congenital Zika syndrome. That's thought to affect about 5 to 10 percent of babies born to women infected with this virus just before or during pregnancy. Of these infants, up to two-thirds would experience intellectual disabilities, though the long-term consequences are not super well-defined. And, but what we do know from, what we, from the data that we have is that although the lifespan of these children is not thought to be reduced on the whole, severe problems can arise due to microcephaly, which is one of the um, sequelae that we see. Problems feeding, impairments in motion, vision, hearing, and speech, developmental delays, seizures. And some of these might be fatal, severe seizures, for example, but this, again, depends entirely, almost entirely, on the context of care. And where these children are being born and how they're being cared for. And again, there's the cost. There's not been enough data on this to be entirely sure, but the CDC and others have estimated the lifetime cost of a child with congenital Zika syndrome as being about $10 million, and that's in the US context. Zika is tricky. And I talked about difficulties of detection. And actually, a higher than expected number of children born with microcephaly is often the first signal that a Zika outbreak is underway. Because the symptoms of the adult infection are very similar to other diseases. Dengue, chikungunya, mild flu-like symptoms, it could just be a mild flu. And control measures for Zika are twofold. You have control of Zika itself through vector control, although this has problems as well because the mosquitoes are Finicky, finicky beings and don't like to be killed all that easily, and, um, or through uh, the sexually transmitted route. We can also control that. One of the reasons why Zika hasn't been a GCBR, Z, a congenital Zika syndrome hasn't been a GCBR in the traditional sense is that for now, this mosquito is geographically restricted. That's not going to be true forever, though, as we see the effects of climate change. The range of these mosquitoes is going to expand. They're going to interact with naive populations in far further reaches of the globe. And these mosquitoes have been, in their ones and twos, been seen in more temperate regions in places in Europe. So we need to be prepared. We need to be vigilant. We can't wait for some cases of microcephaly popping up in hospitals for that to be our first um, understanding that that's what we're facing. So what can we learn from looking at these examples? Mm -hmm. That dissection that we did revealed some interesting insights. None of our cases were GCBRs under most traditional definitions, but all of them could have been. If you imagine like a da dashboard of dials, each with certain characteristics, it was often just one or two dials that needed tweaking. They would have been. And so those dials are the ones that merit particular attention and where I think we can draw lessons. These are the dials that we need to pay attention to, not just for these diseases that I was just talking, talking about or for emerging diseases across the globe, but for the really big ones. <clears throat> 
Some of these are pretty obvious, so I won't go into them. Things, pathogenicity and virulence, um, mortality, transmissibility, susceptibility, that kind of thing. Others are more specific. Detectability. How do we know that a problem is a problem? And this is absolutely key for chronic disease, because we're in a sense presupposing an insidious phenomenon. This is distinct from ease of diagnosis. This is the recognition that something is amiss in a population, and it relates to the specificity of symptoms. For example, the first, infection, first indications might be quite generic, these mild flu-like symptoms, HIV, polio, Zika, millions of other, millions, lots of other infections. But this may also extend to further symptoms beyond that initial infection. The constellation of symptoms associated with AIDS made it difficult to recognize in the early years of the epidemic in the United States, for example. And that's one of the reasons, by my understanding, why it was so difficult to package together as a syndrome. We have detectability, we also have di diagnosis, and that is the recognition that it is an agent, a genetically distinct one, that is responsible for the phenomena that we're seeing. Again, early in the AIDS crisis, there were hypotheses that this might be respiratory illness due to the use of poppers in nightclubs. I mean, it's preposterous now knowing what we know, but until you know how to diagnose, wh or what you're trying to diagnose, this is very difficult. Next, we have the speed of disease progression how quickly the disease goes to the end state, whether this is irreversible or reversible morbidity or death. How much time do you have to act? How much time do you have to administer post-exposure prophylaxis, for example? For an emergent disease, how much time do you have to develop it in the first place? And then we have morbidity and sequelae, which are what are the actual consequences? Is it lifelong care? Is it life in an iron lung? Is it recurrent exhaust periods of exhaustion where you can't function and, have, and, and live your life in the way that you want. And that is the, also related to the degree of care needed. This cost can be calculated in several ways, and none of these are perfect. Um, man hours of carers, economic cost of interventions, health-related quality of life metrics, highly contested, like qualies, dallies, that kind of thing. But also externality-based measures, like loss of income for carers, for example. And finally, engineerability. How much is known about the genetic characteristics of the pathogen, especially relating to transmission, speed of progression, all the characteristics I just talked about? How much is known about the elements of these pathogens how can be manipulated in the lab? What is the feasibility of performing these experiments? How free is access to the technical knowledge, the genetic data, the physical materials, and the infrastructure? We could do this for good, to develop countermeasures, of course, or for weaponizability. So, on this cheerful note, I will end here and hope that it's just been a glimpse on how we can maybe think a little bit more broadly when we think about catastrophic risks and the lessons that we can learn. That was really great, thank you. Um, and finally, we have Joachim Reitfeldt, who is also a research associate at CESA. Um, we're going to be uh, returning specifically to COVID and uh, because Joachim is uh, very active within the learning the lessons from COVID, which I'm sure many of us are looking forward to. Okay, cheers Joachim. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me first start with giving a bit of background to the lessons from COVID project. So this was a project that started about a year ago at CSER. And uh, we're interested in analyzing the pandemic response and analyzing the key moments, critical moments in the response where particular interventions or decisions or the lack of uh, decisions and interventions significantly altered the death toll. So we explicitly take a global catastrophic risk uh, perspective in that regard. And to that end, we have identified a number uh, of, of clusters uh, that we want to focus on in our research agenda that we recently finalized and as first of all, pandemic preparedness. So then you can think of uh, running uh, pandemic exercises and training, uh, having relevant stockpiles of PPE, and having relevant decision-making uh, processes and structures in place for when a pandemic actually occurs. Uh, and then we've got early action. So what kind of uh, actions uh, are, are taken in the first few months after an outbreak, and after an outbreak is declared a pandemic, uh, we've got a cluster of vaccines, and then finally, non-pharmaceutical interventions. So those are things like lockdowns, mask wearing, social distancing, uh, all interventions that uh, aim to slow uh, the transmission rates uh, that are non-pharmaceutical in nature. Uh, 
And within these clusters, we've also identified relevant aspects. So first of all, we asked, what was the information base? What was the information available to decision makers when the, the novel pathogen of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 was detected? Uh, and what were then uh, uh, decision-making processes? What did they look like? What kind of expertise was consulted and what expertise uh, was not uh, consulted? Uh, then we look at the questions of implementation and capacity. So when you take certain decisions, are you able to implement them? Do you have the relevant capacities to do so? And we also look at communication. Uh, so now I want to speak about a few key themes that emerge from a panel uh, like this. And, and first of that is vulnerability. Because I think many of you will remember that in the early days of COVID, uh, there was an early narrative that uh, we were all equally affected by COVID and we were all equally vulnerable. Uh, so we heard about prime ministers and presidents uh, uh, affected by COVID, uh, being hospitalized, admitted to ICU, and there was even talk about COVID being the great equalizer uh, um, at that stage. And of course, that soon changed as we learned that Certain communities, particularly poor and minority communities, were disproportionately affected, often because of, of frontline occupations they held, uh, about dense living conditions, other socioeconomic factors. Uh, and then globally, uh, a big issue um, uh, was, of course, vaccine inequity. So rich countries were able to produce and pre-purchase vaccines at, 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 a, at a very big scale. Uh, and we even saw that uh, rich countries were starting their booster campaigns, whereas uh, many countries in, in the global south uh, um, still had frontline workers and healthcare workers waiting for their first dose, uh, which was a massive uh, uh, problem uh, with regards to global justice, was also raised many times by the WHO as, as a thing that really uh, deserved our attention and still deserves our attention. It's still a, a massive challenge. Um, so then there's also an issue of inclusion. So in many countries, we saw uh, that scientific advisory bodies were set up in the, in the UK that was SAGE. So you have a, a group of experts that advise the government on, on what policies to take and how to approach uh, the crisis of COVID-19. But we can also critically ask if these uh, bodies are actually reflecting uh, the, uh, the, the populations, uh, uh, the wider population. So do they um, kind of represent different communities and groups as well? Uh, so to ensure that uh, particular challenges that felt particularly in, in uh, certain communities are also voiced and, and represented uh, at government level. And I think or asking that question is also answering that, is that often we haven't seen that diversity within these, these uh, expert bodies, which is definitely something um, to, to uh, also learn lessons from, that we should do this uh, differently next time. Um, and obviously, we're now also starting to talk about recovery. So what lessons are we actually going to learn from COVID-19? Uh, first of all, uh, my hope is that we will really see much more structural investments in pandemic preparedness. Uh, so uh, previously, we've had many years of, of uh, cycles of um, panic and neglect. So there would be a local regional outbreak. And we've had a lot in the past 20 years, like SARS, MERS, uh, Ebola. Uh, so yeah, when, when there's an outbreak, there's a lot of attention and there's panic and, and there's this notion that we really need to do something. But if after a few months, it seems that uh, the outbreak is manageable and it stays local, regional, we have a period of neglect again and we wait until the next outbreak. Uh, so that's something we will really need to do differently to be better prepared next time. And I think what will also be really important is that we will engage in critical self-reflection, especially in the West. And uh, I think that in the first few months after COVID was detected, that there was a strong sense of complacency in Western countries. It was seen as a Chinese problem. Uh, uh, there was stereotyping as well. It was a typical Chinese reaction, lockdowns, very top-down, authoritarian. We would never do anything like that. And uh, they're overreacting. It's just a strong flu. So, so there was a sense of complacency and it was a, not a sense of urgency at all. And I think that was also hand-in-hand hand with overconfidence because uh, many Western countries have been sending health experts all across the globe to advise governments on how to tackle health emergencies, how to do that. Uh, so there was a sense that actually we were pretty well prepared. We had the experts, we had state-of-the-art health systems, uh, you had things like the Global Health Security Index that uh, tried to make a ranking of uh, 
countries with regards to pandemic preparedness. Many rich and uh, countries were, were topping that list. It was even mentioned by Donald Trump at the time that well, we're number one, number two when it comes to preparedness. So we're fine. You can all uh, you can all sleep sound because we're prepared. And of course, that that turned out very different. Uh, so I think there's there's a lot to be learned uh, from that. That we uh, can show a lot of uh, show a lot more humility. And, and um, in, in that sense, and, and learn from other countries, because we saw many countries actually in the global south uh, that when uh, uh, the WHO sounded the alarms, that they were very eager to engage, uh, engage with the WHO and, and to um, have discussions of what kind of actions uh, needed to be taken. And, and we saw uh, uh, much less engagement uh, uh, from Western governments in that sense. And again, that overconfidence that w we know how to handle these things. We don't need to talk to the WHO. And that, that turned out to be uh, uh, not the case. Um, so finally, uh, I think there's an important question if we will see an inclusive recovery. In the short term, that means that we really need to urgently address vaccine inequity. Uh, so we will need to see many more vaccine donations, uh, either through COVAX, bilaterally, other multilateral arrangements, that's, that's highly needed. Uh, uh, but then also, uh, with an eye on the future, uh, it will be necessary to uh, also build production facilities across the globe, and not only in, in predominantly in rich countries, so that when we have an next pandemic, we can very quickly develop vaccines uh, very close to the communities where they will have to be delivered, uh, and that will then hopefully also address uh, vaccine inequity in the long term. Uh, but I think also very importantly is uh, if we want to have an inclusive recovery, we really need to learn from those communities most uh, uh, proportionally, disproportionately affected by, by COVID-19, but which are at the same time often communities that are socially, economically, and, and, dis and uh, uh, politically uh, disenfranchised, and we really need to learn from how this crisis has affected them, uh, and then to incorporate these lessons and also uh, include them in policy making. So next time we'll face a pandemic or another GCR, that we have the tools to also protect these communities uh, much better. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We, we have a very brief time for questions, and I've, uh, I've just got a few online first, but think in, if you're in the room, do think of some. Um, we've got a few for Robin, and um, David Wood asks, uh, well, you gave some striking examples of bad communications about COVID from various politicians. Uh, do you have any positive ones uh, who communicated better, and want, what prevents the rest of us from learning from their examples? Um, we've got a meme from Crystal Foyer that goes something like this. <laughs> um, we also have a question for, from Robin from um, Arena Mat Matanas, which, uh, which goes, um, involving other communities like the faith or AIDS communities have worked well in some situations. How do we find the relevant communities for any given crisis? Uh, it seems to require having broad contact network for the GCR community and a system for bringing the relevant ones into the loop efficiently and diplomatically. What are your advice on how to achieve this? I think that's probably enough for now. <clears throat> Lovely, thank you. Whoops. And thank you to the fellow speakers. Have I got the right microphone? Yep, okay. Um, they're great questions. I mean, I think in terms of good communications from politics, from politicians, I talked about Jacinda Ahern, and I do think she had just the humanity and the straightforwardness um, and speaking very openly and honestly and personally as a mother as well as a leader. At the same time, with no disrespect to Kiwi friends, it's more of a, a city, you know, it's, it's a small country and that proximity and warmth of communication is more viable in that kind of context. Um, the other example I've been given, and I, I stand to be corrected by Australian friends, is the Premier of Victoria, whom I believe had a very similar approach in an Australian you know, across the different um, parts of the country, there were different COVID responses. And I, I think it is telling. I think, strangely, in some ways, the Italians did it a lot better as well. I think it's just, you know, fundamentally, I would say the mix has been about um, 
getting the humanity into the conversation and getting the truthfulness about what we don't know, um, but also sort of allowing for a roundedness. And, and, and I think when we overthink health catastrophes as being about science, we miss the opportunity. And that's, you know, th that, that I think has been the challenge. Um, and, and so the communicators that have done well have been those. And I, I think the, um, the new administration in the US has rebalanced some of the challenges of the way um, that the, the communication was done. So those would be my immediate top picks um, for, from uh, politics. But I did want to pick up on a couple of points that Joachim made about inclusive um, structures around managing COVID because actually some countries really got this right um, and I suppose Canada um very interesting example in terms of having had a very small epidemic. I mean, again, pretty good communication from the top. And like uh, South Africa, they have had national coordinating committees that have been led by people with experience of the HIV crisis. And I think that has been very interesting because those uh, people who've often come from a sort of fairly classic public health background, but have been schooled in human rights and health. And so they've taken an approach which is, is much more inclusive and also is inclusive of of communities um, and I think those could be interesting models I'm not just going to hammer on HIV because it's my thing um, but but I think I think we do need to think about that and I think we need to also be really cautious on recovery I, I um, stupidly missed my final slide which were the two images of it's not over a campaign that I ran at the Terence Higgins Trust in the early 1990s when people were saying that the AIDS crisis was over and we ran a campaign called it's not over and also some images that I saw in central London in 2020 saying there will be better days and this is when I was staggering along trying to get more than five minutes walking in a day about three months after becoming ill and there will be better days so there will be different days and I think that's one of the things as we talk about recovery we need to be sure that we're not talking about going back to how it was because it's not going to go back to how it was and we have an epidemic of anxiety amongst children and young people that we need to address and that do no harm is so important. Um, in terms of the point about bringing in communities, faith aids communities, thank you for picking up on that. I think the truth is we have to look where the risk is. And actually the communities most affected by COVID in this country, yes, there was the huge impact on black and Asian and other ethnic minority communities here at the early days, but also the impact has been on health workers and on care workers. And we're really not doing enough at listening to them. And one of the things that from the health workers I know and the doctors and nurses who are struggling with long COVID is they're expert patients. They understand what's happening in their bodies. They understood and they were trying to respond both from what they were experiencing personally and what they were seeing in the people they were caring from. And we've really done pretty badly uh, at listening to them. So I think when we want to reach out to communities, it's really about being granular with data and looking carefully. And the ONS actually has been phenomenal. I think they've been the heroes of the British epidemic. Um, they have really solid data about where the risks lie. And, and I would be starting by looking there. Um, and, and then it depends community by community how you reach out diplomatically. <laughs> got a couple of questions for Julius, but before that, I'm going to give the microphone over here for the first question. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I um, wanted to, to point out that with regard to the COVID, what I really found interesting in terms of the experience and the lessons learned is I find that when it comes to the communications, there's no unified structure. And that basically, I think, is one of the major faults of this whole experience. I mean, you know, now I live in the United States where all of the individual states have their own jurisdiction when it comes to COVID. I lived in, in Vienna during the pandemic and basically even small Vienna with a total population of 9 million couldn't guarantee that there was a unified structure because the figures were worse in Vienna but not in the other parts of the country and so therefore there was no unified messaging to the people. And that was really bad because the other thing is is that even lower Austria where most of the people uh, communicate um, uh, uh, commute to Vienna basically had different regulations, but they commuted every day to Vienna, basically. I mean, that's, that's what it was. So I think that there also have to be lessons learned in terms of a unified communication structure, because that's the message that's going out seems to be very, very confusing to people. And when it comes to Germany, my home country, they were able to actually get a unified structure, even though the federal states had their own uh, responsibilities, but they were able to top down, basically ensure that there was a single message that went out as far as the virus is concerned. 
a really important point. I think also, though, I would pick up on one of the points that Lara made, which is um, about the fact that different communities need, need different messaging. And so when I think about what we did well in HIV, um, we did many things not so well, but we had a backdrop. We almost had the wallpaper message. So they, those AIDS don't die of ignorance messages. People, you know, the, the Grim Reaper in, in Australia, people can critique them and say, oh, they were too alarmist. But what they did was they created that backdrop of unified conversation, and then they enabled people to get focused. And I think we haven't got that balance right on COVID. So, you know, and, and particularly it's more challenging because we do live in the fake news environment. We do live in the democratic access to information that may or may not be correct. And so the challenge for official communication channels is how do you deal with that and how you might communicate to a bunch of anti-vaxxers in Bali is going to be different from how you communicate with care workers in Surrey. Um, and they are going to need slightly nuanced messages against the backdrop. So I think, I think it is one of the, the challenges and perhaps where we've gone a bit wrong with COVID is trying to give one message. So the message stay indoors was very effective for the short period of time. But then when people came out of doors, you know, I remember hearing so many people going, I don't have to wear a mask now. It's not illegal. Um, to, and, 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 but maybe, you know. Thank you. Uh, that was Angela Kane asking that question. And uh, then go ahead. Introduce yourself. Sean Hagerty, Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. This is, well, maybe a question for Joachim, but for maybe the entire panel, one of the fascinating things about trying to learn lessons from COVID is that it seems to me that every every couple of months it flips. Every uh, exemplar we have of a country that's handled COVID really, really well, three months later it's a disaster. Hong Kong's the most recent example, but you know we talked about China, you know, came down too heavy, but then that seemed like genius. But now they might be walking into a food security crisis because of heavy handling. So I guess my question is. How long is it going to be before we can really learn robust lessons from this? And to what extent are we going to be limited by the fact that it seems to you that with such a complex challenge, if you handle one aspect well, you open up a vulnerability to be kind of blindsided from another side? Yeah, thank you. Excellent question. Uh, I think, yeah, that's, that's very true. We had in the, in the first wave, we had an idea of some countries really getting it right and others not. And then we go to the next stage, vaccines, and then some countries really doing that really well. That struggled maybe in, a, in the first phase. So I think it's, it's uh, kind of breaking up those lessons, maybe also in the clusters that I identify. So we can think about pandemic preparedness and then look at which countries did that really well? So which countries actually already had an infrastructure in place before this pandemic emerged? So we can, when it comes to preparedness, we can really learn from them and how to set up successful exercises. Then perhaps we want to look at the countries that were really quick in, in rolling out vaccines. What were the factors kind of leading to that success? Uh, perhaps we can see that uh, there were a few countries that overcame uh, vaccine resistance. So what kind of communication tools or what kind of uh, um, means did they use to do so? So I, I suppose um, I think it's helpful not to think of successful and unsuccessful countries, but to like break it up in these different clusters and then to see where can we uh, yeah, learn the lessons in uh, different parts of the world. Yeah. I'm going to have to move on because we've got so little time. Uh, I've got a couple of questions rolled into one from David Wood and uh, Matthew Randall. Um, so they're both for Julius. Uh, so um, were there wrong lessons learned? In particular, uh, the rush to close nuclear power plants on the basis that they're going to kill everybody. Uh, and uh, following up from that, Matthew Ra Randall, uh, that... Um, uh, wouldn't tighter regulation of nuclear power increase its costs, then encourage states to substitute fossil fuels, and then increasing the risk of a genuine worldwide catastrophe? Thank you. Uh, I think the second question is really important, but but maybe we don't have time for it, so I'll focus on the first one, because isolation ev and evacuation is maybe an aspect of the Fukushima disaster that has some resemblance to some elements and issues, social issues of the COVID uh, pandemic as well. Um, I think it's, it's possibly a, a wrong framing to see the botched uh, and 
hasty and in hindsight excessive evacuation around the crippled nuclear power plant as a wrong lesson. I would rather see that as an immediate response and um, a response uh, that had to be uh, decided on upon uh, enormous scientific uncertainty. Um, I think in hindsight we can now say that uh, the um, evacuations were excessive, overly precautious, and they did indeed lead to uh, a lot of deaths uh, in the area of at least 100 or so. Um, I think what's, however, wrong to, um, to assume is that in any future similar scenario, governments wouldn't be politically pressed to react in a similar way. I think there's always, and the COVID pandemic has shown this as well, there's always an, uh, an element of panic, uh, social uncertainty and social reactions, and governments, in, at least in democracies, have to respond to that. So I think these hasty evacuations will be seen again in future uh, nuclear accidents of of the same scale, and there may be, uh, they have to be factored in, in uh, as costs uh, and likely uh, consequences of nuclear meltdowns. Thank you very much. I'm Jenty Kershwood from UNDRR, and I have one comment and one question. And the first one is, I'm glad to tell you that I think that in terms of the move from single hazard to multi-hazard to a more systemic approach to hazards, uh, there is actually now quite a movement. And there is a document that we published as UNDRR last year, which is a new set of hazard definitions along with the International Science Council, which does in fact include technological disasters along with 303 others. And I'm happy to share a copy with you. And I think that's an example of, a, of an approach to looking more multi-hazard. But actually my question is, uh, I think the point that you make about the financial disincentives for the private sector in when disasters get too big, we can walk away. That lesson from Fukushima, I think, is incredibly interesting in the context of the climate crisis. And I would be very interested to hear if you think there are particular elements as we sit now and in, in the next year or so and the discussion around loss and damage and the discussion about managing and also incentivizing the private sector in the context of climate change, uh, you know, really speeds up, what, what lessons you'd have for those processes? Thank you very much. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think it is a feature of corporate law that enables innovation, that enables risk taking, that you can form a corporate entity that shields you from liability if something goes wrong or the corporation goes bust. And that's very important for driving innovation. But if we know an activity to be inherently dangerous, I think there, there is a big problem of moral hazard. And I would argue that we have to uh, make um, fundamental changes to corporate law and corporate governance to um, reduce these moral hazards. Perhaps in the area of fossil fuel companies, it's already too late, because if we factor in all the externalities that have been uh, created for the world, um, I think I would assume or estimate that all of these companies would be, would be bust uh, tomorrow. <laughs>